Good evening, Hope family and friends. Welcome to Thursday Night Bible Study. Uh, it's December 10th, 2020. It's Pastor Lake Jay. Just wanted to um, welcome you once again to our time together where we get to study God's word, where we get to dig deep and unearth some of God's truth and discover, rediscover, uncover those things that we may not have known and allow it to be a blessing to us as we continue to grow in him. And so tonight um, I want to take a look at a very familiar passage of scripture, one that we uh, have read before, one that we've looked at before, one that we've studied, but God brought it to my attention and and kind of an extension, if you will, of uh, what was shared on Sunday, in particular at 1115 a.m. service. So uh, before we begin tonight, I want to, uh, as custom, uh, offer a word of prayer. So please join me wherever you are. Gracious God in heaven, I thank you and I praise you for this day, this time, this opportunity you've given me to gather, or given us rather, to gather together virtually once again to study your word. Father, we pray that in these moments that you, or in this moment that you've given us, that we would attune our heart to your spirit, that we, Father, would eliminate any distractions that might come to pull us away from this time that you've ordained for us to to investigate, to discover, und- uncover um, your word. So I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds, that, God, you would uh, arrest our attention and help us, God, to focus in on you. I pray, God, that this time would bring you glory and you honor and that we, your body, would be edified and strengthened to continue to serve you in this world that you created and established so long ago. Pray this in the strong and the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen, amen. Again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, What we're going to do is look at uh, the epistle to the church at Galatia. So Galatians, we're going to start at, uh, or we're going to be looking in chapter 6. And I don't have a a whole lot, but I think what I have, or at least what God has given me, is 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 hearty. It's it's something that we can uh, definitely um, feast upon and and receive some some nourishment from. So Galatians six six, uh, we're going to look at the first three verses, and depending on where we are, you know, in terms of time, we. We may continue on further, but we're just going to start right there. So I think I have the New Living Translation tonight. So Galatians, uh, I'll put it up six, one through three. Uh, And just look at the first verse. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back on to the right path. So uh, in layman's terms, um, folks, if if there's one of you in the group uh, who finds themselves struggling with some sort of sin, some sort of uh, addiction, some sort of, of uh, stronghold, the ones of you who are strong in the group, the ones of you who are godly in the group should with gentleness and humility help that individual or those individuals get back into the right path. Now, the question that I ask myself and I want to ask you all who are, are, are listening and viewing tonight is how many of us have wrestled with overcoming a particular issue? We were good in so many other areas, but in this specific area, it just seemed to be a source of frustration and failure. Um, we tried and tried, but this thing just kind of had a hold on us. And we, for whatever reason, you know, we thought we were over it. We thought we had, you know, put it to the side, but but somehow it, it crept back in or, you know, we, we didn't pay it much attention at first, but but then we got another taste of it and then we wanted more. And then we started to sneak off to go get it. And then we uh, became all consumed by it and, and then fell into this sort of pit of despair, this this uh, trap, if you will, this web 
that has now locked us in to whatever that thing is. Well, the good news is I want all of us to take a moment and just relax. Inhale and exhale and relax because we all are in good company because the truth of the matter is, is the entirety of humanity from its genesis to the present has dealt with the results of the fall, which is the bondage of sin nature. So every one of us, every human being that God permitted to be born into this world and to live has at some point in time wrestled or struggled with sin and trying to overcome the power of sin. Now we know that Jesus came into the earth, that he lived a sinless life, that he was the only uh, capable and, and acceptable sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And through our relationship with him, we can overcome, we have overcome the bondage of sin, but sin itself still exists. The temptation to sin still exists because we are human beings uh, who still exist in this uh, particular uh, body, this, this form, this shape, this fashion. And so even again, after that transformation, sin continues to lurk at our doorstep and it waits to pounce. And the reality is, is that there are times along the journey that we can get caught up in a thing uh, and end up straying from the path. And 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 what what the Bible calls it is backslide. So you 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 know, for those of us that have grown up in church, we may you know have heard uh, heard uh, someone during testimony time or testimony service say, you know, I want to uh, say that I'm in a backslidden condition, meaning that they are. They're in the church, but they're but they're not really in the church. They they they've fallen out into that that place and that space where they know they shouldn't be, but for whatever reason they can't seem to get out of it. And so I wanna I wanna say that that just because an individual may find themselves in a backslidden condition. Just because somebody may find themselves wrestling with uh, this this thing, it does not mean that they, you or I, are worthless or any less valuable to God and his kingdom. We, as we learned on Sunday, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation that is possessed by God. In other words, God owns us as his um as, as his creation, and because he owns us, we are heirs uh, and, and heirs to the promises of God, to the benefits that come through our being possessed by God. So it's like, as you know, my children, you know, they are heirs to whatever you know I may have. So if if I if if whatever I have they are privy to to receiving it because they are connected to me. Not that I own them as they are my my uh, my tools or instruments, but in the fact that they come from me. That that through my wife and I uh, coming together, God allowed these uh, uh, offspring to to come and and live and be. And and as a result, they are entitled uh, by way of connection, by way of relation to those benefits and privileges that that come with that. And so that's what we experience as believers. We experience the benefits and the privileges of the kingdom because of our relationship and our connection to God. He is our creator and Christ is our savior. And the Holy Spirit is the one that leads and guides us as we continue to move forward. So no one who belongs to the body of Christ should ever feel as though they've done too many bad things that they are unforgiven and or incorrigible. Because if that were true, then what? Uh, then that would have nullified the efficacy of the cross. And we already know that the cross, the work on the cross was sufficient, sufficient enough to set the captives free. Meaning that we who were bound by the uh, uh, power of sin have been freed 
through the liberation, through grace, through the grace uh, and, and the faith that we um, proclaimed in Christ Jesus. So none of us are, are, you know, those who are in Christ are free from that power, are free from that bondage. But again, it doesn't necessarily mean that we won't ever fall or falter again along the way. So if another believer is overcome by some sin, in other words, if a Christian fails and falters, those of us who are godly, because the text indicates those of us who are godly should be the ones to, with gentleness and humility, help that person or those persons back onto the right path. Now, the question, the obvious question that we have to ask and answer is who are or who were the godly that the writer was referring to in the text? And who are the godly that we can, you know, point to in our current context? And the answer is the godly were those who were filled with the and governed by the spirit of God. That word godly means spiritual. And that word spiritual means to be filled with and governed by the spirit of God. See, what the godly in the text understood and what the godly who are current in this current context understand is the truth of God and God's word. See, the truth of God cannot be altered. It can't be changed. It is perfect. And the truth of God's word has no error. It has no inconsistencies. It has nothing in it that would lead us in a way that would reject the truth of God, that would pervert the truth of God that has been revealed in his word. So those of us who are godly understand that point. The word and the truth of God go hand in hand. And that's what allows the godly to remain anchored in place when trouble comes, when difficulty comes, when testing comes, those who are godly are sustained, are anchored in that place of safety and security in the word of God, because they're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. So that when the waves of life's trials and circumstances come, although we may sway or although they may sway, they are not torn apart. They are not destroyed. And so Again, the godly are those who are filled with and governed by the spirit of God, filled with and governed by the spirit of God. That happens upon that transformation. So at salvation, we accept Christ as Savior. The Holy Spirit comes in and regenerates your heart, renews your heart and mind, sanctifies you, meaning sets you apart, makes you a special possession of God's, right? And fills you and governs you. So the authority that is granted is no longer I or me or us. It is God. It is God's spirit. And so let me just pause and say that the godly are in no way perfect, right? Only Christ is perfect because there was no other individual that has lived or ever lived or ever will live that is perfect other than Christ. We know that. But godly folks, they understand how to navigate and maneuver the landscape of this wilderness called um, called the earth because they have given themselves over to the will and the way of the Lord. And I know that today there are still some of us who are grappling with issues from our past. There are still areas of our lives that we haven't fully committed over to God. Paul said in Galatians uh, uh, 2, in, in the second chapter, 2 and 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, right? Paul was explaining that his the entirety of his living had been exposed and submitted to God for review, for God's use and God's purpose. But some of us, even though we've committed ourselves to God, there are still things, still areas that are strongholds that we haven't given over to God, that we struggle with 
um, because we just haven't been able to let it go. We haven't been able to fully trust the Lord. There's been some things that we've experienced pre-Christ that have continued to hover and continue to come up for us. And God is saying, listen, I know that was an issue. I know that was a concern, but give it to me because if you give it to me, I'll help you along the journey. So it's a faith issue. It's a trust issue. It's a willingness to give, submit and surrender it over knowing that God can do with it whatever he wants to and that in God's hands is the best place for it to be. Because trust me, when we try to do it, when we try to manage it, it always messes up. It never, ever works out the way that it should. It may feel good for a minute. It may subside for a little while, but ultimately it will lead us back to the place of uh, devastation and, and sometimes despair. So again, we're still grappling with issues that, 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 that have trapped us from our past. And it's up to those of us who are godly to help those who are struggling to get them back on track. And we do this with gentleness and humility. In other words, we acknowledge their humanity. We acknowledge the humanity of the one struggling and we protect their dignity. Now that's important. We acknowledge their humanity and we protect their dignity. The reason I say that's important is because we have to understand and remember that human beings are fallible creatures with a propensity to be selfish. And when this predisposition fights against a believer's transformation, it's important to recognize that it's not their fault, right? Habits and proclivities are always easily broken. And so when we experience folks who revert back to a particular stronghold, we need to acknowledge that they are human beings subject to slipping and falling, right? As, as, as human beings, we have, uh, we were born into sin, shaping in iniquity, right? There is an inherent sin nature and that sin nature, right, is, is transformed by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. And yes, we come in Christ and are made new. And so the old is, is gone and the new has come. Yet and still, there the, again, as I said before, sin still lurks at the door. The devil still continues to pursue us in order that we might reject what we have accepted as truth and go back to living the lie. And that's a human tendency. Because of our frailty, because of our fallibility, we have a propensity to focus on ourselves. We have certain habits and proclivities that pull us away from the truth of God and end up putting us in a position where we're hurting uh, not just ourselves, but we're hurting others. We're hurting those that rely on us. We're hurting those that are looking at us as examples of Christian living. We're hurting essentially the kingdom because when we allow, when those who are weak within the kingdom allow those things to happen, it, it, it gives off this, this message that, you know, can be confusing at times. And so for the godly, it's, it's a responsibility in gentleness and humility to protect, to, excuse me, acknowledge this issue of humanity while also um, uh, simultaneously protecting their um, dignity. And, and so we extend the same grace, the same mercy that we ourselves received, right? And we also don't demean, belittle, or uh, shame them for their predispositions or predilections, I should say. We don't allow others to embarrass them, nor do we wag our fingers in disgust. 
Family, the godly understand that it could just as easily be them in need of support instead of the other person. And that's why the writer insisted that the godly be careful in their own lives for the possibility of falling into a trap themselves. Have you ever been uh, in the company of, of, of others and, and heard this? I can't believe that he or she would do something like that, right? Have you ever been the one to say that yourself? You, you saw somebody who claimed to be Christian or claimed to be holy and righteous, and, and, and they ended up taking a, a, a step in the wrong direction. And so all of a sudden, you know, you see it as, you know, they're no better than anybody else. Or it, you see it as an opportunity to pull them down, to, to you know, disgrace them, to, to devalue them, um, only to, to, to make the situation worse. Because when we do that, when we look at others in judgment, and when we uh, demean them, when we belittle them, and when we shame them, we we don't we don't we actually end up hurting ourselves. We end up hurting them, but we actually end up hurting ourselves because if we call ourselves a body and we each and we all belong to that same body, talking about each other, shaming each other, casting judgment on one another, belittling each other. Uh, uh, disparaging each other does no good. It doesn't help anyone. As a matter of fact, it brings us all down. And that's not what God called us to do. That's not what the writer here is uh, ex is is encouraging uh, those believers to do. Um, we never really know what we would do if we were in the situation that the other person was in until we find ourselves in that situation. So to suggest or say that I would never do that, well, you know, maybe, but let times get hard. Let resources be scarce. Let you be in a situation that seems untenable. And who knows what you would do? Now, the deeply rooted, strong, godly, I've been trusting God, I've been with him for, for so long, Yes, they know how to endure. They know how to persevere. They know how to make the right decisions. But even those folks grow weary at some time. Even those folks can fall and, 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 and go the wrong way because none of us have it all together. None of us um, have all the answers. None of us are living the perfect life. We're all trying to get to the same place. And there's different ways that that people think that they can get there but there's really only one way and that's through Jesus Christ. Now folks may be at different points on the journey but we're all headed to the same destination as believers. We are all marching towards our heavenly rest. And some are, you know, advanced, some are, you know, way ahead and others are just getting their start. So we have to learn how to support each other wherever we find ourselves along life's journey. And, and tonight, this text is helping us to understand that there are some who are stronger and there are some who are weaker. There are some who are you know, struggling in particular areas of their life, and there's some who are overcoming in other areas. And that's um, the, the image of, of an a, of a entity that is moving, an or organism that seeks to support itself so that it can move as a collective um, to the destination that it's heading. So we don't look at the one who is weak and shame them for being weak. No, we have pity and mercy and go to them with the same grace, the same kindness and compassion, as the text says, in gentleness and in humility and acknowledge that this is a human being and this human being deserves for their dignity to be protected. There's no sense in, you know, when, when unfortunately we live in, in, a, in, in this instant society, this technologically advanced society where folks are so quick to pull out a phone and record uh, someone else's misfortune. Now, I'm not saying that phones and the cameras aren't useful because, yes, they are. But many times I find when viewing videos, it's of people's misfortune and it's to to kind of shame them to kind of expose their 
their frailty, to kind of put them out there to make others feel better about their misfortune. So it's like I, like I said, you can point at them and say, well, at least I'm not as bad as them, or at least I'm not struggling like that. Or I can't believe they would even do something like that. How can they call themselves a Christian? Well, saints, like Jesus said, he who was it without sin, let them cast the first stone. So any one of us at any time, if we have a perfect record, let's all let's stand up, be acknowledged, be recognized. But the truth of the matter is none of us are. So we all have to keep our seats because only Christ is the one who can claim that title, who can claim that honor and distinction. So with that said, we have to um, be careful, right? To uh, not fall, as the text says, be careful not to fall into the same temptation ourselves, right? We have to understand that it's about walking with and alongside, supporting, helping, not putting somebody down so that we feel better about ourselves, not looking at the misfortune of someone else or looking at the struggle of someone else as a way to justify our insecurities and our shortcomings. No, this is about building up and strengthening those parts that are weak. This is about supporting, uh, putting in place um, the, 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 the structures that will hold up those things, those areas that need some extra support, right? So instead of casting judgment, we should empathize and show and demonstrate the love of Christ. The next verse says, share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Now, this does not mean that you engage in the sinful behavior, right? It doesn't mean that you go and find the person where they are and, and you start to engage in the sinful behavior with them. No, that's not what that means. It means that you do whatever is necessary to arrest the fall and realign the position. So you do what's necessary to stop the bleeding and to get them to a place where they can start the healing process, right? And and, and that can look like uh, if somebody is struggling, let's just say with pornography, that doesn't mean that you go to where they are, you sit with them and you watch and you um, engage in, in viewing and, and all those other stuff. No, what, 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 what I could do is I could help them to cancel their membership and their subscriptions to those websites. I can help them clean their computer and put it, you know, put in uh, safeguards to help them when they uh, feel the urge to go back to that. I can help them get rid of the movies, uh, the DVDs, the, uh, the magazines, all of the material that they have uh, acquired that caters to that, that thing. That's what it means when it says share each other's burdens. I can, I can uh, take, help somebody clean out their, their cabinet where they have uh, the liquor and, and, and the other uh, things that, that uh, um, I can help them destroy the drugs that, that they've uh, put in, 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 in their drawers or, or whatever the case may be. We come alongside them and share in the burden, not that we have to experience the burden, right? I don't have to get high to understand what is what 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 struggling with an addiction is. I don't have to watch the pornography to to understand why this individual is uh, is 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 caught up in it. I don't have to do that. What I can do is, is I can appreciate that there is an issue. And I can come alongside them and demonstrate the love of Christ. Because love, as described by the word of God, keeps no records of wrong. It doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. It always protects and always trusts. It always perseveres. Love never fails. And so by coming alongside of them in love, Family, 
those who are caught in the web of sinfulness can experience the light and the love of Jesus Christ. They don't necessarily have to feel embarrassed or ashamed that they're dealing with some issue or concern. They don't have to worry about being exposed and humiliated for uh, having been overcome by sin. Because again, saints, at, at some point we all have come and experienced or been at a place where we weren't proud of ourselves. We've all done some things, said some things that we don't want anybody to know. There's some things that we want only God to know and, and, and for God to keep because if it were to get out, we would feel horrible. We would feel the shame. We would feel the guilt. But thanks be to God that Jesus Christ, through his blood, has forgiven us and washed us clean of those things. So if we who are strong in the faith understand that we've been cleansed by the blood of Christ and forgiven for all sins, then why would we lord over someone their issue, their circumstance, their stronghold that they're dealing with as a way to keep them oppressed or under our feet, as a way to make us feel better and a way to keep them down? It, again, as I said, it benefits no one. It benefits no one to do this. This is why I believe Pastor was telling us on Sunday that we ought not throw people away because what's the point of that? God is the judge. God is the jury. We don't have the, 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 the intellect, the insight, the godly disposition to tell the difference between the wheat and the tares. We, we don't know. The best we can do is look at the fruit that is born um, and make an assessment. But even that isn't necessarily enough. It isn't necessarily sufficient for us because we have a finite mind. We are finite creatures. And so when you look at that, it's a reason why God appointed his angels to do his work. Uh, it's a reason why God has set us up in the way that he has and why he has put safeguards in place for us to be a, a community, a body um, of believers that supports one another. So it's God's love that we ought to exemplify in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds. It's God's love that helps us to serve one another. Because if we're honest with ourselves, if it wasn't for God's love, I don't know if we would be so quick <laughs> to serve, so quick to support. If it wasn't for God's love that is unconditional, that is pure, that is um, rich, I don't know that we would be so willing to get get in the, the muck and the mire with somebody to help them get out. Those who are strong, again, those who are godly. Because that's what, that's what the, the text is tr trying to help us understand. That's what the text is trying to, trying to push us to, is the place where we humble ourselves, where we look beyond our, our needs per se, look beyond our, uh, our accomplishments, our achievements, and, 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 and look at the humanity of one who's struggling and see that it could be us. As a matter of fact, it was us and how we were blessed and benefited by somebody else coming alongside of us and extending a helping hand, offering us the love of Christ, offering us the gift that we, you know, rightly didn't deserve and couldn't earn. So it's something that God is showing us, especially now when our country, our nation 
even our churches are becoming more divided. Now is the time where we acknowledge that God, that Christ is our central, is the centerpiece. Christ is the linchpin, is, is the one that holds us together. So it doesn't matter if you're black or white, doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, doesn't matter if you are holier than thou or if you fall every single day. In Christ, we are being perfected. We are of equal status. And I know I'm getting a, a, a little bit ahead of myself. Well, at least y'all don't know that, but I know it. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So let me just come back to this, this idea of, uh, again, sharing each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. So again, when we are willing, those who are godly, those who are um, right, living uh, as, as being guided by uh, God's spirit, those who are um, committed to the work and the way of God, when those folks come and they get alongside that individual and encourage them, they are, in, a, in essence, obeying the law of Christ, which is, right, what? to love God and to love others. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and to you know love your neighbors as unto yourself, right? So we, the godly, make manifest those commands. We bring them to life. We actually become a, a living representation of the unconditional, pure, rich love of Christ. And who wouldn't want to experience that kind of love? Again, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 that love never fails, right? Love does a lot of things. It, it, it doesn't keep records of wrong. It doesn't hold grudges. It, it protects, it trusts, it hopes, it perseveres. Love does a lot of things. And so Jesus taught that as believers, we are to be that example, that we are to, that if we love God, that we would obey his commands. And so if we are to obey his commands, which is to love God and love others, then we can't be selective about who gets that love. Loving others takes the focus off of ourselves, right? Loving, I should, let me say it like this, loving like Christ takes the focus off of ourselves and puts it on others because Christ's love was not selfish. The love of Christ did not focus inwardly, but rather focus outwardly. When you look at and reflect upon the life and ministry of Jesus, love permeated everything that Christ did, everything that Christ said, everything that Christ thought. Love was the catalyst. Love was that thing that motivated him to do what he had been. Uh, sent to the earth to do. And so saints of God, hope, family, and friends, God is calling for us to prioritize the love that we have for him and others. And I'm what I mean to say is that we we take that love and we move it from loving ourselves per se, to loving those who need it most. And in this particular context, it was those who were struggling. It was those who were weak. It was those who found themselves in a bad way. They needed the love. They needed to be reminded that they're uh, okay, that no, it's not okay what they were doing, but it, that they were okay, that they their personhood was okay, that their humanity, right? was okay because as human beings, as created beings in the image and the likeness of God, we have an intrinsic value. We have an intrinsic worth. So yeah, the acts, the the thoughts and the, the words that are that are hurtful and 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 reject the truth of God, yes, we don't, you know, uphold those. We don't say, oh, that's okay, you're doing that. No, that's not what this is talking about. 
What this is saying is that you demonstrate God's love and that you don't judge that individual. You don't hurt that individual with words. You don't come to them, you know, waving the finger like I told you so. No, you come with open arms and an open heart and open mind saying, listen, it looks like you're struggling. It looks like you are in a bad way. It looks like you need some help. Let me pray for you. Let me help you in this journey that you are on. Let me uh, come alongside you and partner with you. Share that burden. So if it's, you know what? I'm going to call you every single night. You know, with AA, they have these, you know, accountability partners. I'm going to call you every night and, and make sure that, you know, you're doing what, what you're supposed to do. I'm going to encourage you. We're going to pray. We're going to read the, the word of God. We're going to, you know, come to service. All of these things are ways in which we demonstrate the love, the grace, and the mercy of God. So, saints, let's 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 come and think on how those who are godly, we who are godly, can live out this text. How we can see a brother or sister struggling with an issue and in gentleness and humility aid them and help them get back on the right track and not be so high and mighty and pious to think that we're not susceptible to falling ourselves, right? The text says, if you think you are too important to help someone, this is verse three. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Now I like this translation. This is the new living. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're fooling yourself. You're only fooling yourself because you are not that important. Now, Paul wasn't saying this um, in a way that, um, cause, cause again, when we read the Bible, we, we bring ourselves to it. That's that's uh, ex, uh, eisegesis. That's that's bringing ourselves to the text and and reading it from our perspective. So I don't, you know, yes. While I I think there was some attitude in it, I don't think it was the attitude of hey, you're you're worthless. You know, you're you ain't nothing. You ain't bad. You ain't nothing. You know, A.K.A. Michael Jackson. You know, that that's not what he meant. What he what he was saying here is that. You ought not think that you too good to get your hands dirty, right? Because there were some in this 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 uh, this church, and 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 again, Galat the, the Galatian church. Um, some believe it was a group of churches because it was throughout the province of of of, of uh, Asia Minor in Rome, um, and some believe that it was one particular group. But whichever way you lean towards, those individuals. Again, we're trying to come together and um, eliminate some of those differences that existed among them. And there were some who thought that, you know, I'm good. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm saved. You know, I do good works. I, 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 you know, I take care of me and mine, and and I don't have time to be concerned about what everyone else is doing because I've got this image to uphold. And the bottom line is, is that that's the, that's the, the misrepresentation. That's the, as first lady would say, stinking thinking that leads to devastation further along the way. Because when we start to assume and we start to think that we're too good to get our hands dirty, we're too good to show up on a Saturday and hand out food to those less fortunate. When we start thinking we're too good to um, go and into a homeless shelter and minister, when we think we're too good to um, uh, take money out of our pockets and, and bless someone else who may not have, when we get to that place, the apostle was saying that you, you need to you need to be knocked down a few pegs and, and understand that you're not that important. In other words, when we think about our position in Christ, we're all on equal plane. There is no Christian 
uh, that has been born, that that is to be born, that can find themselves being, you know, on a higher level in Christ than someone else. Christ doesn't have rankings or positions within his kingdom. We are all children of God. We are all members of the body. And we all have different responsibilities, right? We all have our particular gifts, but our gifts don't make us better or worse than each other. And so we have to understand that um, in Christ, again, there is there is not a a uh, a setup where one individual or a group of individuals stands above another. And I'm not talking about leadership. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm not saying that, you know, you, you, your leader isn't over, you know, your leader's over you and therefore they're better than you. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is in the eyes of God, in the sight of God, we are all equal. We are all joint heirs with Christ. We are all able to receive the blessings and the benefits of the promises of God. There isn't anyone in uh, the kingdom that can say, I've done so much more and I deserve so much more than the others. No, we're all equal. We all have sin and come short of the glory of God. And so Jesus, he loves us all equally and unequivocally. And when you think about Jesus, Jesus was the master and the model of servanthood. So if Jesus, who is our Christ, who is the incarnate logos of God, could walk before humanity in service to God the Father, then what would prevent any one of us who claim to be his disciples from serving others, from uh, model, or from mimicking what Christ demonstrated? What reason, what excuse could we come up with that would be good enough to justify our neglecting of serving others or our uh, neglecting of being a, uh, a servant of God. There's nothing, nothing we can say, nothing we can do. There is nothing that would justify it. And so haughtiness, arrogance, and even narcissism are all culprits in the theft of a willingness to support others, especially the weak in the body of Christ. So, so what I'm trying to say is when these things start to infiltrate the body, that's when you see fractures. That's when you see um, damage occur because somebody, you know, because the enemy, not somebody, the enemy comes along and does what the enemy does best, deceives. Deception is the biggest uh, tool used by the enemy. Enemy comes in, whispers in your ear, don't help that person because they talked about you. You can't go and do this because you have more important things to focus on. What are you going to do if you give this? How will that impact that? All of these things that the enemy throws at us, puts in front of us, is a way for all of us to get off track. And that's why he said, look, don't get beside yourself because you may find yourself falling in that same trap. As a matter of fact, anyone who thinks they're too important, they're just fooling themselves because really they're not that important. Now, let me, let me say this. We are all important to God. We all matter to the Lord. We are all precious in his sight. As far as we go, when we look at each other, we're the ones that start to um, create this hierarchical structure, right? We, we put, you know, a certain particular group uh, on this, this platform and then we put another group here. And all it does is cause division. All it does is brings about uh, this, this divisive nature that, that pulls the kingdom apart. And that's not what is good for us. That's not what God wants for us. God wants us to live in such a way that we all bring him glory and honor, that we all benefit from his grace, his mercy, and his love. And, 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 and so, friends, 
there are always going to be those within the body who struggle um, at certain points. And there are always going to be those in the body who are stronger at particular points. I mean, if I'm honest with myself and, and, and I'll be transparent, yes, there were, there were times when I was that weak individual, when I was the one who needed someone strong in the faith to come and help me, to come get in the muck and the mire with me, to pull me up and out and say, it's going to be okay, that God hasn't thrown you away, that God hasn't forgotten about you, that you are still loved, that you are still a precious child of God. And we're going to go through those, those, those times. And right now, I know it. God showed me that there are some in the body who are weaker than others. And they're hoping, waiting for those of us who are strong in the body to come and help them get out of it. There are some that really want to get out of it. Now, there are those, I think, that they're just struggling and they're content where they are and they're not ready uh, for that um, for that revelation, for that, for that removal from that place. They're not. But there are those who are desperately waiting for those who are stronger than them to come and get in that space and help them to get out. And I'm not saying that Christ can't do it, but what I am saying is Christ uses us to do it. We are his representatives. We are the body. We are the ones that come and, and, and share in that experience. Because if you think about it, it's a privilege to do it. It's actually a privilege to be given the responsibility, the opportunity to help someone else as a means to glorify God and to bless them. That's a privilege. Most people don't see it like that. They see it as a burden. But those who have some spiritual maturity, some spiritual vision, understand that when opportunities such as these present themselves, we're blessed. It is a blessing to go out and help somebody else. It's, it's truly a blessing. And so the godly, right? They understand that a believer who steals from God by not paying their tithe, not paying their tithe, it's not just that individual's issue, it's also their issue, right? A believer who fornicates, it's not just their issue, it's my issue too. A believer who gossips, it's not just their issue, it's also mine. What am I saying? The strong Christian cannot view the weak Christian as isolated and exclusive in their issue. The strong Christian cannot ignore the weak Christian and say, that's not my problem. No, the strong Christian has to view the struggle of the weak Christian as an opportunity to serve, an opportunity to lend a helping hand for the glory of God. So family, Let's lift up rather than put down. Let's help rather than hinder. Let's congratulate rather than condemn and criticize. Let's facilitate rather than fracture. Because when we do, the body of Christ is strengthened. The body of Christ receives repair, necessary repair so that it can continue to function in the way that God designed it. Family, we're in a space where God is calling for the strong to bear the infirmities of the weak, where God is calling for those who understand what it truly means to walk by faith and not by sight, to live by the spirit and be guided by the spirit. We're living in a time where God is calling those individuals to stand in the gap, to intercede, to go into those places and spaces where those who are weak and struggling are and help them come out of it, help them turn themselves around so that we can collectively 
move forward in our mission to build and advance God's kingdom. The work is still before us. We still have an obligation. We still have a duty to uphold the standard and the banner of God. We still are called to witness, to testify, to evangelize, to baptize, to preach and teach the unadulterated truth of the gospel. We, the body of Christ, must not allow division, must not allow differences to pull us apart. We can't do it. We can't afford it. Not right now. When the world is imploding on itself, the church has to, has to stand united, has to stand on the firm foundation that is Christ Jesus. So tonight, saints, we who are strong, let us, we who are godly, we who are strong, let us go to those who are overcome by some sin and in humility and gentleness, help them get back on the right path. Let's remember that we were once where they were and that we were thankful and grateful for the grace and the mercy that was afforded to us. Let's be careful not to get too caught up and fall into the temptation or be you know, susceptible to falling into the temptation ourselves. Because at any given point in time, our circumstances could change. Our situation can very well go from good to not so good. And we may find ourselves facing the same choices that those we're helping are facing. Let's share in the burden. Let's put ourselves in a position of empathy. And in that way, demonstrate the unequivocal, unconditional love of Christ. And then as an added warning, as an added ad admonition or admonishment, I should say, let's not get too caught up on our own press. Let's not think too highly of ourselves. Let's not think that we're so important that we fool ourselves into believing that we don't have a responsibility to be a servant. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to the earth to serve, not to be served. And he showed us the way. So let's follow him. Let's follow his example. Let's continue to walk in the way that Jesus has carved out for us. Because saints, when we do, again, God gets glory and others are blessed. And that's really what it's all about. Glorifying God, honoring God, and supporting each other. Amen. Amen. I pray that tonight's lesson was helpful. I know that in, in my time of preparation and study, God spoke to my heart about where we are as a, a church, not necessarily locally, but universally, that there are some who are struggling and it's up to those who are godly to help, to not throw them away. Yeah, there's some differences in thoughts. There's some differences in opinions. But that doesn't mean that we throw folks out. That doesn't mean that we reject them. That doesn't mean that we cast them out. As a matter of fact, what it means is that we seek to understand before we seek to be understood. It means we give people an opportunity to share with us what's on their mind and what they're dealing with. And then we come and we use the word of God, the truth of God as a means and let me add the love of God as a means to provide support and encouragement. So saints, let's do it. Family, let's do it. Let's pray. Gracious God in heaven, again, thank you for this day, this time, this opportunity you've given us to come once again uh, together virtually to study your word, to dig deep and discover more of who you are and rediscover um, what you've already shared 
with us about yourself. God, thank you for everyone who has decided not robbery to come on and listen and engage in this time of study. I pray, Father, that we as your body would uh, uphold your standard, that God, we who are strong, we who are godly, would look after and look over those who are weak and those who are struggling with a with an issue, those who have perhaps been overcome by a particular sin. God, we know that you're able to break that stronghold. And so we pray, Father, tonight that if there is anyone who is struggling right now with an issue, with a concern, with, with a stronghold, that God, your spirit would break that chain, that you, Father, would speak to the hearts and the minds of those that are feeling down, feeling lonely, feeling depressed, Father, feeling like they have nowhere to turn, no one who understands. May they seek your face tonight. May they hear your voice tonight. May they feel your love and your compassion tonight. May they experience grace and mercy like never before. And may we who are, again, in the body, Father, demonstrate and dispense your love. May we love like you love. May we help and be servants, Father, to those who need it the most. Because at the end of the day, God, it's all to bring you glory, to bring you honor. So we praise your name. We thank you. And we count all of this, God, done in, in the name that is above every name. In the name of Jesus, who is truly and certainly the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen, saints. Amen, friends and family. God bless you. I thank you for joining in tonight. And God willing, we'll be back again next Thursday at 7 p.m. to engage in another study of God's word. Until we meet again, remember, my friend, just see Jesus.